Okay, so in today's video we're going to be looking at the idea of conditional probability. This is a really important concept in probability, particularly moving forward into uh, maths methods. So we really want to kind of focus on, on getting the ideas here right. So conditional probability is when we want to know the probability of an event occurring, occurring when we already know that another related event has occurred. Um, and in these occasions we frequently but not always see the phrase given that being used. So if we wish to know the probability of event A occurring, given that event B has occurred, we would be calculating the probability of A, and we use this vertical line and we read that as probability of A given B. Okay. Um, it should be noted that this is not the same as the probability of B given A, which is the probability that event B occurs given that we know event A occurred. So they're different things, and you need to think differently about those. Okay, so let's think about it quite an intuitive um, example involving some conditional probability. So let's say that I went outside of the room and I rolled a fair die. So standard die, six sides, equally likely to land on any side. So what is the probability that I rolled a six? Okay, so the probability of rolling a six is clearly one in six. Great. Okay, then in part B, I'm going to give you a hint and tell you that I rolled an even number. I went outside the door, I rolled a fair die, I rolled an even number. Now what's the probability that I rolled a 6? So what we're being asked to calculate here is the probability of the rolling a 6 given that we know that it was an even number. Okay, And so by me telling you that I rolled an even number, what I'm doing is essentially reducing the sample space. I'm now telling you that I must have either rolled a 2, 4 or 6. And if you want to then know the probability of rolling a 6, well that's one outcome of the, out of those three outcomes. Okay, Part C, if I tell you that I went outside and I rolled a fair die and I rolled a number greater than 2, what's the probability that I rolled a 6? Okay, So this is, again, a conditional probability. It's asking me for the probability that I rolled a 6 given that I rolled a number that's greater than 2. Okay, So greater than 2 means 3, 4, 5 or 6. So there's four options there. One of those four options is a 6. So there's a 1 in 4 chance that I rolled a 6. Part D, if I went outside and I rolled the fair die and I tell you that I rolled a number that is a multiple of 3, what is the probability that I rolled a 6? Okay, So again, this is a probability of a 6 given that it's a multiple of 3. So out of the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6, the multiples of 3 are 3 and 6. So there are two multiples of 3 and one of those two options is 6, so it's half. Probability, um, sorry, Paddy, if I rolled an odd number, what is the probability that I rolled a 6? So probability of rolling a 6, given that I'm telling you I rolled an odd number, well, um, okay, there are three odd numbers, but none of those are 6s. Okay, so there's a zero probability of rolling a 6 if I rolled an odd, given that I rolled an odd number. So essentially all the conditional probability does is reduce the sample space. Instead of being out of all six outcomes, I'm telling you a condition that allows you to narrow down the sample space to a smaller subset of the sample space. So in the first example, I told you that I rolled an even number. That allows you to narrow the sample space down from six options to three options, and therefore the probability that I rolled a six is one out of those three options. So that's essentially what's happening. We need to rethink the sort of the denominator, essentially the sample space, the total number of outcomes that are possible given the condition that I'm telling you. Um, and I want you to try and get used to reformulating those sentences into the phrase such and such, find the probability of such and such given such and such. So in the question, you know, part B where it says, I'll give you a hint and tell you that I rolled an even number. Now what's the probability that I rolled a six? Reframing that as understanding that that's asking for the probability of six given that I rolled an even number. Okay. All right, let's have a look at another example. In a group of 200 students, 42 study French only, 25 study German only, and 8 study both. Represent the information in a Venn diagram and use it to find the probability that a student studies French given that they study German, German given that they study French. Okay, so um, the numbers we've got here are very straightforward in terms of building the Venn diagram. Um, that's not meant to be the challenge of the question. So we've got French and German. We know 8 study both. 42 study French only, okay. 25 study German only, so we've got 75 in total there. We know there's 200 students, there's 125 who don't study either. Okay, so probability that someone studies French given that they study German. Okay, so given that they study German, that's about the reducing the sample space. We now know that they definitely study German, they are one of these 33 people that study German. 
we're reducing the sample space down to those 33 people. Given that, what's the probability that they study French? Well, there's eight out of those 33 people. Eight French studiers out of the 33 German studiers. So the probability that someone studies French, given that they study German, is eight out of 33. Okay, let's think about the second one. So you remember earlier I said it's not the same just to switch the things around. So this is asking you for the probability that someone studies German given that they study French. This won't be eight out of 33. The condition here is that we know that they study French. That means that we know that they are one of these 50 people that study French. Okay, we've reduced the sample space down from the total 200 students just to the 50 French studiers. And now we want to know out of those 50 French studiers, what's the probability that they study German? So there are eight people who study German out of the 50 people that study French. Okay, fractions in simplest form, so 4 on 25. Okay, example 3. The following table shows the employees of a particular manufacturing company. Okay, and they're grouped according to gender, male or female, and... Um, uh, area of the business that they work in, so production, administration or management. There are obviously a hundred employees in total and we've got all the relevant numbers. Okay, so find the probability that a randomly selected employee is. So if we were to randomly choose one of the 100 employees, find the probability that that employee is male. So probability of, so we might call this PA and oh, we've got management and male. Okay, I'm just going to write the words. Probability of male uh, there are 64 males out of the 100 people in the business, so 64 on 100, um, that is going to be 16 on 25, we simplify it, or 0.64 as a decimal. Not 64% unless the question explicitly asks for a percentage. Um, probability that a randomly selected employee is a production worker, so probability that they work in production, there are 70 production workers out of the 100 workers, 70 out of 100, simplified fraction is 7 on 10, or as a decimal, 0.7. Part C, the probability that an employee is a male working in production. So that is the probability that one of the employees is male and in production. So the intersection between male and production. So there are 52 employees that are both male and in production. So that is 52 out of 100, or 13 on 25 in sim fraction in simplest form, or 0 0.52 as a decimal. Okay, so then part D, find the probability that the employee is male given that they work in production. So it's really important that we're clear about the difference here. Probability of that, that someone is a male working in production, so that's just the probability that they are both male and work in production, versus part D, which is the probability that they are male given that we know that they work in production. Okay, so this is probability of being male given that they work in production. So we know this person works in production, which means the sample space has been reduced to the 70 people that work in production. And we want to know, out of those 70 people, what's the probability that someone is male? So there are 52 males in production out of the 70 people in production. Okay, So that is 26 on 35. Uh, as a decimal, that's not as nice because it hasn't got a denominator of 100. So I, generally speaking, it's easier to work in fractions. Just make sure they're in simplest form. Okay, part E, find the probability that someone is a female manager. Okay, so that's not a conditional probability. That is asking for the probability that someone is female and a manager in this business. So there are two female managers out of the 100 people in the business. So simplified fraction is 1 on 50, or as a decimal, it's 0 0.02. Part F, the probability that someone is a female given that they work in management probability of female given management. Okay, so given that we know this person works in management, okay, so given that they have to be one of the five managers, what is the probability that they are female? So two out of the five managers are female. Okay, so that's a fraction in simplest form or as a decimal 0.4. Um, there's absolutely no need, you don't need to write the decimal values. I'm perfectly happy. I genuinely think it's easier to work with fractions. They're whole numbers. You just make sure that they're in simplest form. Okay, and then the final part here, the probability that someone is a manager given that they are female. 
So probability of being a manager, manager, sorry, given female. So similar to part F, but absolutely not the same. So the condition here is given that we know that they are female. So given that they are one of the 36 females in this business, what is the probability that they work in management? So there are two females in management out of the 36 females. So that is one in 18 as a fraction in simplest form. Again, decimal's not gonna be very nice. It's not got a denominator of 100, so I'm just gonna leave it as a fraction. Okay, so again, really making that distinction between when we're talking about the intersection versus when we're talking about a conditional probability. So you need to be really clear on the language. You need to really re read the sentence carefully, okay? All right, so let's consider the Venn diagram and two-way table more generally. So we've looked at these previously. So we know that the Venn diagram gives us four different regions, which are each um, an intersection between two things, intersection of A and B, intersection of A and not B, intersection of not A and B, intersection of not A and not B. We know those same four regions are represented here in the middle of the um, two-way table, um, but we also have space for all of our totals, okay? Now I've written number of elements because, um, you know, but equally we can also have probabilities in the Venn diagram and in the table. So um, the probability of A given B, so let's think about that in both contexts. So given B, given we know that they're in B, given that they're one of these people here, what is the probability that they're in A? Okay. In the table, given that we know that they're in B, so given that they are one of these people here out of that, what's the probability they are in A? That's going to be that. So what it is here, to work out the probability of A given B generally, it's the number of people, sorry, it's the number of elements or people or whatever in A and B divided by the number of people or elements in B. So it's always the intersection of the two things over the second thing, okay? That can also, it doesn't have to be number of elements. It can also be the probabilities. You can um, have the probability of A intersection B and divide that by the probability of B. Both will give the same result, okay? So it just depends how you've got your information presented as to what's easier to use. Okay, so this is the rule for conditional probability. Probability of A given B is the intersection of the two things over the second thing. So if it was probability of B given A, it would be probability of B and A, intersection of A and B, which is the same as, same as that. So it's got the same numerator, but it would be over the probability of A. And again, it can be number of things in A and B over the number of things in A, okay? So, um, and thinking about that from the Venn diagram as well, if it was A, um, probability B given A, given A, given that we know they're in A, what's the probability they're in B? So that would be intersection over the whole A circle, okay? Um, all right, so as I said, there is a rule for conditional probability and this is it. But in simple problems such as those above, we really don't need a formal rule. You can really think quite logically about conditional probability and I would encourage you to do that where that's possible. But there are occasions where the use of a rule is necessary or at least it becomes quite useful. Um, all right, so let's have a look at example four. If the probability of X is 0.64 and the probability of Y is 0.12 and the probability of X union Y is 0.67, find first of all the probability of X intersection Y, which we're going to need in order to be able to find the probability of X given Y and probability of Y given X. Okay, so to find the intersection, I want to think about what I've got. The addition um, rule for probabil probability is going to be useful to me here. So the addition rule tells me that the probability of X union Y is the probability of x plus the probability of y minus the probability of x intersection y. Okay, so we've got three of these four values. The union is 0.67, x is 0.64, y is 0.12, and then it's gonna be take away the intersection. So 0.67 equals 0.76 minus the intersection, oops. So the intersection must be 0.76 take away 0.67, uh, which is um, 0.09. Uh, 
Okay, so now that we've got the intersection, we can think about the two conditional probabilities. So the probability of x given y, so we know it is equal to the intersection of those two things, so probability of x and y, which we've just worked out, over the second thing, which in this case is the probability of y, because that's the condition, that's the reduced sample space. Okay, So in this case, that is 0 0.09 on the numerator, and the probability of y we've got up here is 0 0.12. You do need to be able to work with things like this, decimals and fractions. You cannot leave that answer like that. But if I multiply both the top and the bottom by 100 here, I get rid of the decimals. That becomes 9 and that becomes 12. And then I can just focus on simplifying. Um, 3 is a common factor there. We get 3 quarters. As opposed to probability of y given x, which will be the probability of x and y, so the intersection of the two things, over the probability of x this time, over the second thing. So it's going to be 0 0.09 still on the numerator, but the probability of x is 0.64 over 0.64. Again, multiplying the top and the bottom by 100, so they're not decimals anymore, 9 over 64. And then we can focus on simplifying if possible. Um, there's no common factors between 9 and 64, and so we can stop there. Oh, sorry. All right, example 5, I think that's the last one. Complete the probability table and hence find the following uh, probability. So let's focus on completing the probability table first. So obviously these two numbers should add to 1. So if there's 0.2 here, there's going to be 0.8 here. Again, these two numbers should add to 1. So 0.38 here should mean 0.62 here. These two numbers should add to 0.38. This must be 0 0.28 here. These two numbers must add to 0.2. So this will have to be 0.1 here. These two have to add to 0.62, which means this must be 0.52, and then we should be able to check the final um, addition and everything all adds up. Okay, so we've completed the probability table. Find the probability of A union B. So remember, in the probability table, the union is essentially these three numbers here. So you can either add those three numbers up, or you can just do 1 minus the 0.52. Okay, so I'm just going to do... 1 minus 0 0.52, which is 0 0.48, but you should find if you add up 0 0.1 plus 0 0.1 plus 0 0.28, you also get 0.48. Same thing. Okay, we want the probability of A given B. Okay, so probability of A given B. So given B, so given that we are out of those 0.38s, um, what's the probability that we're in A? 0 0.1 out of 0 0.38. Okay, and that fits with the rule, which we know is the probability of A intersection B over the probability of B. In this case, A intersection B is 0.1 and probability of B is 0.38. Again, multiplying top and bottom by 100 here, that's going to give us 10 on the numerator and 38 on the denominator, and then focus on simplifying the fraction once you've got whole numbers, 5 or 19. All right, probability of not B given not A. Okay, so that means it's going to be the probability of not B and not A, the intersection of the two things, over the second thing. So not B and not A is here, 0.52, and then the probability of not A is 0.8. So that's going to be 0.52 out of 0.8. Again, let's multiply top and bottom by 100. So that is the same as 52 on 80. Uh, they're both divisible by 4, so that's 13 on 20 in the simplest form. Alright, and then probability of not B given A. Again, it's the intersection of the two things, not B and A, over the second thing, which is A. So not B and A is this one up here, 0 0.1, and the probability of A is 0.2. Okay, so we're going to have 0.1 out of 0.2. You might be able to see straight away that that's going to be half. Multiplying top and bottom by 10 gives you 1 on 2, half or 0.5. Um, yeah, if you want to write them as decimals, you can, but it's really just not necessary. Okay, so exercise 8D is the practice for today on the conditional probability. Really try and get a sense of thinking really logically about your conditional probabilities, not always immediately jumping to the formula, but obviously there is a formula to help you with the problems where that is helpful.